This was a few blocks together though. It wasn't just the one or? It was just one block. You know, it was 1,023 square meters yeah. with a 20 meter frontage. All right, well, why don't we jump into actually finding the site then? How did this all begin? Yeah, I've got to thank my wife on that one. Um, you know, we, we're always looking. You know, we're always looking for opportunities and development sites. Mm -hmm. So uh, one day I was having a barbecue at home and my wife basically said, I want this block. You know, so uh, to us, you know, we, we know the area. We've been there before uh, and it was quite easy to make that call. We went, uh, this was a Saturday afternoon. You know, we went there to see uh, the block on Sunday and uh, we basically made an offer on the spot. You know, and, and that offer, you know, was actually $30,000 more than anyone could have offered. So uh, we, we wanted to secure the block. Talk me through that. Why? Why not just pay like the, the asking price? Uh, I don't want to compete for good opportunities. You know, so the, the idea in, in long term, again, goes back to my philosophy. Uh, the $30,000 that we overpaid potentially is worth, worth nothing nowadays. You know, so it makes no difference whatsoever to knock everyone off, uh, you know, the, the, the bidding list. And, and secure the block, you know. So today we can see that it was actually worthwhile. What made you believe in it so much then? Because we're talking like, what is that, seven, eight years ago now, 30 grand. And from what I understand, you were still pretty fresh in business then. You'd been building a portfolio, but you weren't as established as you are now. I'm just trying to think back to, to like 30 grand, like in when you go, how do I say this? When you're kind of looking through that lens of maybe a little bit more financial scarcity, that's a bit of a punt, isn't it? Well, it depends, you know, um, in my mind, I always thought big and I knew that I, you know, somehow would make it. So uh, it was quite natural for us to make that decision uh, and basically secure something that we could see potential long term. And so were you on the hunt, hunt for a development site at the time or is it just like you're always kind of on the hunt or? We live on a hunt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we live on a hunt. We're, like, we're always looking for opportunities, you know. So one thing that we've done is that uh, we, we defined uh, the, the type of properties that we are always, um, you know, keen to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they pop up, you know, we got to be ready to rock and roll. Okay. Well, talk to me about financing then. Now, obviously, as a broker, I'm just assuming things are going to be pretty straightforward. But were there any kind of like curly issues you had to solve or? Yeah, it's no different from most people. You know, despite the fact that you're a broker and you do have, you know, a, a bit more knowledge than the standard person, um, you know, in securing when looking for finance, mm -hmm. uh, the, the questions that are going to be asked um, are exactly the same. So uh, we got to prove that we're able to pay for, for the loan and, and, and hold it long term. Now, the idea that we had you know, on this development in particular was to buy and hold all of them, so all five units. So we're talking about, you know, let's call it a $1.8 million loan. Um, you know, that's on top of everything else that we've got. So most banks, you know, um, considering the, the markets and uh, you know, the increase in, in, in construction costs, et cetera, you know, they're quite hesitant in lending the money. So for me, it was quite interesting, you know, to actually go through the process myself and arrange the finance despite the knowledge that I've got. Interesting. And, and so at the time then, so that you'd purchased the, the site for how much did it actually cost? Uh, $580,000 back in 2015. Okay, so five eighty. And so does that mean when you were moving forward, you constantly had, all right, we need to keep like 1.8 up our sleeve for construction costs? Is that what you're saying? Well, when we purchased the block, you know, um, we, we had the zoning you know, of the block was correct. So we knew at some point we could actually do and complete the development for five townhouses. But we're not prepared at the time. So I did not have any number in my head. So what I wanted to do was basically to secure the block, yep. and then let it let it do its job in terms of um, you know growth, mm -hmm. and then look at the finance for the you know for the five townhouses down the track. And what we did in you know we're talking you know in 2021 is that we looked at the numbers and uh, the numbers stacked up. And we said, look, no, now it's a time to push ahead and complete the development. Okay, so nothing too curly about the the actual financing side of things, but it was a little bit different having to actually go through the process, obviously, for yourself. But what was there, was there anything, I suppose, notable or something that, that's a good takeaway for anyone listening now, thinking along the same lines of, I can't do the whole thing, but I'd like to start like laying the foundation? Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was curly. You know, it, it's probably not as curly for me because I was prepared. I was ready. You yeah. know, so it took me, you know, a good seven years to be in that position to do, to do that job. Um, so I think if someone comes from the streets, you know, it's the first development and never had any sort of experience whatsoever, um, then, uh, you know, there's a massive growth, you know, learning growth, not just pulling, the, pulling the, the development together, but arranging the finance and speaking to the builders um, and, and going through the whole process from A to Z. So uh, for me, 
obviously, you know, there's a massive learning curve. Mm-hmm. But in some areas, you know, I was quite comfortable because I was pretty ready to uh, to push that button. Okay. And what did the initial fees look like? Oh, I, I'm not a big fan on, on, on fees, or believe it or not, you know, because I believe that, um, you know, when you're doing something long term, uh, you know, the market does its job. You know, so in terms of rental returns and in terms of, uh, you know, the capital appreciation, mm-hmm. the market normally does its job. So um, because, I, you know, when I purchased the developments, I knew I would do it. I just didn't know the timeline, you know, that would complete it. Uh, I basically left it for the market. But when we started the project, you know, I did really some really basic numbers mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, the square meter rates, you know, for the development itself. Uh, and the numbers, you know, stack up okay. So uh, if if they did, you know, I just basically push ahead. Uh, and if they didn't, the bank would not lend me the money. So uh, it was quite easy for me to basically look at, uh, you know, a really high level figure and say, yeah, first, I can afford it. Second, you know, the properties will be cash flow positive. And third, there will be some capital appreciation here as well. How do you stay calm with the approach of like, take action now, sort out the detail later? Because I can't help but think there's a few people listening going, what? What did you just say? There's there's no fees though. There's like, is is this just you as a person, or is this just like like you've kind of just explained your confidence is that solid in the market to to do the heavy lifting? Like, what is it? Yeah, I think over time, like once you've gone through the process of investing so many times, and you have assisted people, and you've listened to so many stories of uh, people being successful in property, that gives you that extra level layer of confidence. That, uh, you know, as long as you've got time and you don't have to really be too concerned about the cash flow, uh, that things, you know, will basically work out. So uh, that takes, you know, the financial pressure and uh, you can, you know, press start and stop, you know, whenever you feel like. Okay. So your, your I guess, FISO was very much like a, I've got faith in the market. I've got confidence in the market due to basically just having a, a solid knowledge of how market cycles work and you, you know it's going in the right direction. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And the location was brilliant, you know. So uh, one thing that I always talk about is, you know, buying the right locations uh, and the location was, you know, a hundred meters from the beach. You mm. know? So, um, you know, when you've got the right zoning with the uh, right specs in terms of property and uh, it's been so close to the beach, you know, technically, you know, you will perform over time. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what the equivalent would be in like Sydney and Melbourne. So you're about 30 meters, uh, 30 meters, 30 minutes, uh, 40 on a bad day from from Adelaide. Um, and you, you literally, yeah, probably like 100 meters from the water. It's it's so close. It's not quite Esplanade, but it almost may as well be. But but as far as locations are concerned in Adelaide, it doesn't really get too much better than that for half an hour away from town. I uh, don't think so. You know, uh, we're quite passionate about the area because there's two beautiful beaches around, plus all the wineries as well. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, anyone wants to wants to live in a nice place, they want to be there. You know, so um, yeah, we, we have that confidence in the markets and the knowledge as well. Talk to me about the challenges. So basically what I'm hearing is you you paid 30 grand over. You were happy to do it because you were like, no, I'm confident in this. I know how this is going to move forward. You had a few challenges with the finance side of things, but nothing really like huge. It wasn't like a, a, all these hoops to jump through. The initial fees though was just, I'm just so confident in the market. This is This is going to be a deal. I know it is. Now, what happened when it actually started turning into a project? What were the challenges that you were like, oh, I didn't see this coming or like you really had to overcome? Well, one thing that I normally do, and it's probably part of my personality, is um, I own everything that goes around me, you know? So uh, if there's a problem, even if it's not mine, it becomes mine. So it becomes quite easy for me to deal with problems, yeah? One thing that I always say, and this would be in Portuguese, being my mother language, or in English, is uh, uh, it's a different uh, vocabulary altogether that I had to learn. So, uh, you know, the, the types of materials, the language that was used, you know, by the engineers, by the builder, all the tradespeople involved, you know, it was all new for me, you know, and, and that would have been new in Portuguese as well. So that itself was a quite, um, you know, quite, a, quite a challenge. Knowing the materials, the combination of colors, you know, the, the sense of space, looking at, you know, a piece of paper and trying to figure out how to build five townhouses that they were actually um, good and uh, and also... Because uh, they're high spec, aren't they? They're high spec, you know, so we picked some uh, some really good specs as well, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I don't think of you as having, like, any kind of language issue. Like, you and I never talk and it's like, what did he say? Like, 
but but I guess uh, yeah, I, I I don't think of actually doing deals in other languages, and then technical aspects of deals in other languages. Like I speak bits of a few languages, but not I'm not actually fluent in any. And to think of it that way, I bet there's a lot of people right now that may have moved over here from from China, from India, uh, India, from Brazil, like yourself, like that are like yeah, this is actually one of the reasons maybe I don't do more technical things because. Maybe that is a bit of a, a challenge in the back of the mind. So how did you, like, what did you do to overcome it? Yeah, confidence. You know, like you gain confidence over time and by listening, by uh, doing the research, by trusting the professionals that you actually engage, using a bit of, you know, the gut feel as well. Um, so it's a combination of things, you know. So um, you don't need to know everything, but you need to trust people that you engage to do the work. Um, and, and for me, you know, uh, I think I made some really good calls uh, using my gut feel, you know, a lot of the time. And, uh, and trusting the professionals, you know, to, to make it all work. And how did, like, price changes in COVID and all that kind of stuff affect things? Uh, massive. You know, it was a massive change, you know. So to give an example, you know, the first quote that we had for the build was just over, you know, 1, point, uh, 1, 1, 250. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the time we actually signed the contract, you know, that figure went up to over, you know, 1, 600. Yeah, wow. uh, and, and that was in a matter of six months. So, you know, the timber price had gone up, you know, the whole thing had gone up and uh, it goes back to my, you know, my personality, you know, am I going to complain and stop or am I going to just own it and just keep doing, you know, and, and that's the decision I made. And and what was Lucy like during the process? Is she like, she's in your corner or is she starting to feel it or like how, how'd this go on the relationship? No, Lucy's, Lucy's in my corner, you know, every time, you know, she trusts uh, and she believes that, uh, you know, what we're doing is um, long term will always pays off, you know, always pay off. Such an important thing to have a partner that's like right by your side. It's massive. It is massive. You know, uh, with, without her support, um, yeah, I, I dare to say that I couldn't. I couldn't be where we are. Love it, mate. Well, what what other kind of challenges were there? Are there any others that that kind of come to mind that you had to overcome? Um, yeah, there was always that uh, I'll call fear of you know changing in prices as an example. You know, or any variation because you know it being the first time when you when you're doing the development for the first time, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong, and you got to trust that uh, you know the builders will be use common sense. You know, the tradespeople use common sense, and uh, any mistake that we made uh, or any mistake that we could have made would cost us five times more. D- can you talk to me about one, like one of them that comes to mind? Yeah, we didn't make many mistakes, you know, I must say, because we were quite thorough, you know, in the brief and also the build was quite serious as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, any variation that we did, you know, uh, was times five. Anything that we did was multiplied and magnified. Uh, and that mistake could be a $1,000 mistake. It could be a $10,000 mistake. So uh, well, I was always quite mindful that, um, you know, we're doing the project, you know, we were going to make mistakes. We just didn't know where and how much that would cost. So that was a conversation I had with Lucy, you know, many times over because uh, it is a concern. Like when you're trying to do everything that you're doing in life, mm-hmm. your personal stuff and uh, doing a, uh, a pretty significant development. Can you talk to me about how you actually kept control of the budget then? Because like what you're saying, if everything is magnified and multiplied by five times being five townhouses, it, was this just a learn on the go or was this something that you focused on beforehand or how'd you do it? it it's part of the planning. Working with a budget, you know, with people that are serious about what the work they do, yep. it's fairly simple, you know, because everything's expected. The, 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 challenge, the, the changes in prices happened beforehand. Mm-hmm. So uh, once we actually nailed it and uh, we knew that the project was a goer, there was no changes. You know, the, the only changes that were there uh, was, there were minor, there were minor stuff and things that we created, you know, to improve either the layout of the home uh, or, you know, the, the look and feel of some things that we, we felt were quite important to change. So managing the budget in that sense was quite simple. For anyone now thinking, oh, I'm still not sure about building. There's just builders going bankrupt, uh, left, right and centre. And like, it feels like I've actually stopped reading them on APN. Like we on Fridays, we do a, a news segment. I see them every week still. It's like blah, blah, builder went bankrupt. And it's just, I'm just sick of saying this. Do you have any kind of tips or anything for, for someone that's selecting a builder just to feel a bit more confident that they're not going to be in that boat? Yeah. Now, Todd, that's a really, really important question and quite interesting that you uh, you raised as well. A bit of background story, you know, like before I started the project, um, I decided to speak to multiple builders, you know, people mm-hmm. that I knew, uh, people that I have assisted clients before, uh, and um, I filtered, you know, three builders, right? Uh, one of them was on the cheap side, mm-hmm. uh, one of them was in the middle, and the other one, you know, basically attended, you know, 100% of the briefing that I gave him. And uh, it was the most expensive, you know, because it, it builds luxurious homes um, 
most most of the time. And being a developer, you know, you're normally looking for that uh, right balance between return uh, on the money that's been invested and, and the profit margins. Mm-hmm. So my decision was based on the brief that I gave and on my gut feeling. So I end up choosing the, the most expensive builder at the time, not because I wanted to, you know, brag about it, but because I felt good about it. You know, so my gut feeling basically said, go with this builder. Funny enough, uh, builder number one and builder number two went bust. Um, so, you know, this project that I can now tell it was a success story, you know, could have you know, easily been. You could have been holding a little disaster. Well, not a little disaster, five, five townhouses. Yeah, you know, that could be just, um, you know, quite painful. Um, and uh, because I followed, you know, my gut feeling and, uh, you know, we had a really good and thorough brief of the whole project, you know, I knew that the builder could sustain the development and could go from A to Z and finish in a, in a, in a timely manner. I know it's hard to explain gut feeling and, and to a certain extent I might even be asking an impossible question. So feel free to skip over this one if I am because I know like George Soros is apparently famous for changing his positions in the market for literally like a pain in his back. And it's just like, what? But the guy's a billionaire, so we all listen to him. But is there anything that you can, I suppose, explain to someone that, that what was it that gave you that feeling? Was it was it the the organization the developer had or the builder had? What, was it uh, the way they took their time with you? Like, is there something you can pinpoint that helped you have that gut feeling? Yeah, to me, it was a direct um, relationship with the owners of the bu- the building company because it was a boutique type of builder. And you know, I could ask straight questions, you know. And one of the questions is, uh, are you guys going to be alive? You know, are you going to sustain and finish this development? How long can you commit to finish this? What if uh, there's any delays? So I asked some, uh, you know, difficult questions, you know. I could feel, not from the words that they were using, you know, but the body language. Coming back to the experience, you know, in dealing with people and, uh, you know, not dealing with just one project but multiple things, you know, it sort of helped me to uh, create that um a sense of comfort, you know, and use my gut feeling to make the right calls. I think we are naturally pretty good lie detectors as people. Some people are just better at um, identifying it, but I think like you've put it perfectly when it's like a, a gut feeling. And and what I'm really taking from that is maybe if, if someone is concerned and they are wanting to build, don't be afraid to ask some direct questions and then just let, let that like BS mode just kind of go like, is, is it going off the charts or is it going, no, okay, this, this is pretty good. Yeah, you know, you got to use it. You know, it's part of the decision making. You know, it's not all about numbers and in, in, in technicalities. Uh, you, you're you going to get sold, you know, and you sell. But the reality is, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you know who you're speaking to and you got, you know, not just referrals, but, you know, trust, which is a pretty big word, uh, yeah, you can use it to your advantage. Awesome. Well, what are we looking at as far as the, the overall project's final numbers? Because you, you've done pretty well out of this one, mate. And I'm sure if you could replicate this with every development, you'd be a very happy Andre. But, but what, what are we looking at as like a high level final numbers? Yeah, the, the figures that we're using, you know, really high level right from the start is that we're, we're trying to get to the 20% return, mm-hmm. right? So that's on, on capital. What'd you have? Um, uh, 23, 23% is what we got. Yeah. Yep. And I- even after all the, you know, the variations, you know, that we, um, that we accepted, but, you know, but that's just part of the calculation. What I really wanted to do, and this is the, the real return to me, is to be able to build five townhouses where people could create their stories. Uh, I've been a rented, you know, rented before, and I know how painful, you know, it can be mm-hmm. if you live in a place that is not really good. So uh, what I really wanted to deliver, you know, and this is probably part of the legacy is to build five townhouses, which I could be proud of, uh, my wife could be proud of, my kids could be proud of, and still, uh, you know, be able to you know, to have people being happy and fulfilling their lives there. Yeah, you you really do have that as well. Like I know some people might be thinking, oh yeah, sure, it's just the profit, but I can tell you, I've known Andre for for a while now. There genuinely is that sense of pride you get from this, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, I, I believe in good karma. I, I've gained so much from this country, you know. I've been quite quite grateful, you know, to for all the things that I've uh, you know I've gotten so far. So might as well just do something good. And uh, building a home or you know multiple homes in this case, to me, is just part of the process and part of the, the giving back. Oh, that's beautiful, man. Well, and if we are looking at the the numbers side of things, what what did everything cost all up? If we're talking about site acquisition, building costs, uh, all, all of your other fees and everything, what what are you looking at? Yeah, two million five hundred forty four is the number that I can get to. Okay, so around two two point five or two two five four, um, and and what's the the final vow? Three million three hundred is uh, the figure that we came up with. That's huge, and so you're looking at around eight hundred thousand dollars profit. That's correct. Yes. 
Okay. And and cash flow wise, what's the the yield on them? Um, well, we're talking, you know, 630 to 650 rent per house. So $165,000, you know, give or take in, in rental returns and um, interest only repayments, you know, touching about $10,000 a month, anywhere between forty and $50,000 in cash flow positive uh, from day dot. And that's where they are now. And you've got one of them as an Airbnb, if I got that right? Correct. Yes. So we're testing the Airbnb, you know, being one of them and that's pure cash flow. So whatever is coming from the Airbnb is it goes straight to the pocket. Hey, that's fantastic. Look, are there any other kind of like uh, big takeaways or learning curves that you got from this development that if someone was to knock on your door right now, it'd be weird if they did this, but maybe send you a text or an email and say, hey, man, I'm looking at doing a development as well. Like what what are the big lessons? Yeah, you got to know the, the final outcome before you even start, you know. So this is, um, you know, how you purchase the block. Who owns it? So most people decide ownership of the block um, after it's purchased. You know, so that has a massive impact, not only in, in you know, capital gains and, you know, and accounting uh, from the accounting perspective, but, but also how you handle it, you know, um, and what you actually do with that development, development as well. So from my perspective, I always knew that I was never going to sell. So I wanted to keep it. And what I wanted to do is be able to share the, the income with my wife. Um, so we, we had a trust structure, you know, set up right from the start. So there was no additional costs involved in changing the trust, you know, from a personal uh, to a trust structure, um, you know, before the development started. So right now I can actually manage not, not only the cash flow, but all of the tax position that I'm in as well. Back up a second there. We, I feel like you were just flew through something super important then. So it was a trust structure, but then you changed it or I didn't quite follow then. Now, most people, you know, because they look at the investments or buying the house, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll normally look at, um, the house itself and yeah. forget about what they're actually going to do with it. Okay, so, yep. so what we did is uh, we said, look, you know, we're buying this place and the intention is to develop for us, you know, the best structure at the time uh, was to set up a company trust structure um, with myself and the wife, you know, as part of it. Uh, and so what we did is, you know, all of the, the developments was actually done inside of a company trust, which gives us the flexibility, not only to distribute the income, but the capital, um, gains uh, if if we ever decide to sell anything. Fantastic, mate. Yeah, absolutely. What Andres just said there is a very easy one. I feel to to gloss over as I almost wasn't following. Then I'm sitting right in front of him. But but make sure you are speaking to your accountant because the the difference between making what is it eight hundred thousand dollars profit if you were someone that wanted to sell and being able to actually distribute that like Andre is saying and if you just held it all in your own name that's going to be a huge difference in your tax bill 100 percent, yeah so that's something people normally decide to consider after the purchase and ideally you know you speak to the accountants uh, and have the structure right uh, before you even make the purchase love it mate what's an action step for anyone that's listening right now and thinking i'm pumped i'm ready to go let's build some townhouses what, what's something that someone can do right now? Pull out the headphones and, and get straight to work. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I normally say is uh, anyone that's investing, right, um, can become a property developer if they want to. Um, because becoming a property developer, you know, as long as you've got the right raw material, that being the land, mm -hmm. uh, you can become one. You can develop and, and build mm -hmm. uh, or you can actually just, you know, subdivide the, the block of land. So what people need to master is uh, the selection of the property. You know, so forget about the house and uh, look at the, the potential, the zoning for that specific location. You know, so that's probably one thing that people should uh, start looking at. Better you become in selecting the right property that has the potential to do a development. The chances of being successful in property are, you know, in my view, uh, much bigger. Reason is, uh, you know, we're talking uh, pizza and property, you know, mm -hmm. so you, you can always look at, uh, you know, one slice of pizza is $5 each. You know, one whole pizza is 20 bucks, you know, so that's the same concept. So if you've got a block of land that has the potential to develop, you know, being demolished, rebuild, subdivide, rebuild, subdivide or sell, uh, you always have a better chance of making a return because you are, you're using the, the pizza concept. I love it. I don't think I've ever heard anyone put it so eloquently as well, mate. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, speaking of the pizza side of things, this is normally when we get to the pointy end of the show where I ask you what's your favorite pizza. Now, you've been on the show before and, and I've, I've been wanting to sort of change up this question a little bit. So for anyone listening now, we've actually got a board in the studio, which I'm, I'm starting to ask people to write down either a word or a phrase that they owe their success to. Now, 
Andre, can you actually expand on on this as a final question? What did you write and why? Sure. Um, I wrote conviction. Um, and, and the reason I, I did that is uh, because sometimes, especially when you're doing something that's quite bold and you don't see a lot of people out there doing it, uh, you know, the first um, response that you get is normally very negative. People don't trust it. People don't agree with you. And, uh, you know, for some people, you know, that could be the stopping point, you know, where you say, look, you know, I'm starting to doubt myself and not do it. You know, the word conviction for me is quite important because I've been challenged, you know, I've been uh, in a position where I, I lost trust in myself. And uh, what I did is I pushed through. And, uh, you know, when I go back, uh, you know, 10 years, you know, when I first started investing and the, what the outcome uh, is at the moment, you know, with all the successes, you know, that we've had, you know, that word for me comes back quite often, you know, it just grows into me because you gotta, you gotta have the conviction that you are capable of delivering what you say you're gonna do. So it is quite important. I formed a really, really strong bond with my words. So whatever I say, I basically do it. I remember someone told me years ago, and it was a, a way of kind of remembering it. I feel like this is a slide of a, a bit of the puzzle that you're talking about. And I think I may have spoken about this on the podcast before, but Volkswagen Beetle, was it was it vision, work ethic, and belief. And, and that conviction really, I feel, is probably the belief element of that. Because if you've just got two of them, like if you're, you've got this conviction and you've got this belief, but you don't have a work ethic, well, you're just going to be that person that talks big, big ideas and never does it. But like you said, it's the follow through. Yeah. You know, one thing that I, you know, I learned the other day really is um, you got to form a strong bond with your own words, you know. And if you want to say something, uh, you either think about it and then you say it, or if you say it, you fulfill it. You know, so that's basically it. So when you put, you know, the conviction with action, it tends to work. Mate, I think that is a perfect way to wrap up this show. Andre Garcia, and thank you so much for jumping on and sharing your story, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. No worries, Todd. Thank you so much for the invite, and I look forward to being back.